Hello everybody. Um, you've got a sick and viral version of uh, me, Erica, right now. Um, I've, uh, I haven't got COVID. Um, that, those tests have come back negative, but I, I definitely acquired some sort of virus from cleaning up sewage water. So there you have it. Um, anyhow, so had she get a pajama-laden version of me. And um, what, um, what you're going to be joining me for today is, uh, game, is basically video three of my game log. Um, and this is my game logs into 80 days. And with this game log, I'm going to be uh, taking you along on a gameplay journey watching some other game players uh, in action. And for this first one, I've chosen uh, this gentleman here called Paragon Plays. I have not watched any of his uh, videos yet, but I kind of liked his, his title, Mutiny Aboard the Water Lily. And uh, uh, he also shares his videos with Creative Commons license so that um, I can take you along on his uh, gameplay journey here. So without further ado, uh, we will start into Paragon Play's video here. A bit of gameplay. London, 1872. I have entered into the service of a new gentleman. It would seem he is a gambling man. If that sounds like a familiar introduction, that's because this is 80 Days by Inkle and Cape Guy. This game tells the story of Around the World in 80 Days if it were set in an alternate universe in which technology developed a little differently. We will see that in a moment here. Check out that black line on the map on the spinning globe. That black line is the journey I just took. I recorded three hours of this game, carefully plotting my way across the world, getting the journey down to 71 days. You guys were supposed to see me in one shot, make it all the way around the world without screwing up, having screwed up twice before. I was so excited when we finally made it and then I realized I lost most of the footage. But fret not, because this game is amazing, so I'm going to salvage that video, and I might even make more, because check this out. See all those white dots? Those are cities I can go to, and they are all interconnected with different trade routes, different characters. You might bump into a guy in a bar who says he's going to undertake a three-day journey in two days by car because he wants to just do that and he allows you to come with him you will find shortcuts there's even a travel point on the north pole from an expansion i'm told i haven't even tried to get there yet but that could shave weeks off of your travel time possibly but this is my path and as you can see on the pacific ocean here the path takes a sudden turn for some reason. That's because you cross the Pacific using a submarine slash cruise ship called the Water Lily. Now I do have the footage from the Water Lily journey and I am a huge fan of this part of the trip. I've done it twice now. So what I'm gonna do is cut that part of the trip down to be its own little segment. Oh, and one important piece of information before we start because this will become very important during the climax of this certain mini story we're looking at. Just before the crash that caused me to restart my recording, which is where we pick up in the footage you're about to see, Monsieur Phileas Fogg and I, his loyal servant Passport 2, were playing a game of whist with several people aboard the Water Lily, one of which was a certain Mademoiselle, who turns out to be a card shark on the run from the law. Passport 2 notices that she is cheating at Whist. Instead of calling her out, I chose to have him make eye contact and give away that he saw her cheating, but also not report her, causing them to have a sort of silent respect for each other. Just keep an eye out for that. So without further ado, I'm going to cut to me in the past as we take on the Water Lily journey. Here we go. So we have 3,001 pounds, we're only 36 days into the journey, and we're already a uh, good portion into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, crossing the United States shouldn't be that hard. I think the Transcontinental Railroad exists by 1871. I can't remember my dates quite exactly. 
I spent the day in the company of the Water Lily Submariners, who were all hardy men and women who preferred the dim and closed spaces of the hold to the top deck. Too much sky, one of them said, squinting suspiciously. Her crewmate nodded. All that fresh air. They shuddered collectively and suggested a bracing race to the boiler room. I impressed them with my physical prowess coming in a respectable fourth just behind their commander. She was a half-Japanese, half-American sailor by the name of Davis. Izumi to my friends, she said, clapping me heavily in the shoulder. Now, a rematch of your choice. Very well, I declared, and probably suggested a test of acrobatic skill. Though the submariners were fit as horses, they had never attempted to, for instance, form a pyramid or walk the length of a corridor on their hands. Uh... I, they competed with me gamely, but admitted themselves outclassed. Commander Davis even applauded. Izumi nodded as I took my leave. You're not so bad. Wow, they're on my side. That's cool. Gavin from the future here. I thought I'd describe a couple of the game mechanics, since me from the past described them about an hour ago and isn't thinking to tell you. Uh, this is a conversation with a random person uh, on board the ship and or train or whatever you're on. You ask them questions and if they are impressed with you, they will tell you different uh, connections you can make at other cities, which is helpful to pass the time during your trip and to help you plan out your next steps. If you get to a city and there are no connections leaving it, you have to spend hours exploring a city to figure out where they go. So as you can see, I now know there is a route from San Francisco down to Acapulco. Even though I'm not going that way, that might be helpful for future playthroughs. I was climbing the rigging entirely innocently and not at all for the purposes of spying on the crew to appease my own rapacious curiosity when I heard two of the crewmen arguing in a pigeon mix of English and Japanese. Uh, I peered upwards, eager to match faces and expressions of the voices I could make out. They were both Japanese, but one of them was dressed in Western style, and the other in Japanese, Hanton and Hakama. As I watched, the trouser-wearing sailor grabbed violently at his compatriot, but missed his footing and tumbled over the platform's edge. I was unable to look away as he fell. His body lay crumpled on the deck, and I heard his scream in my head for days after. I looked up and managed to catch sight of the fallen sailor's companion, his face still and pallid. Was that guilt in his eyes, or merely shock? He slipped away before the captain arrived, and I followed him. He retired to the crew quarters, and I began to hear the sound of desperate, muttered prayers. Here comes the storm pretty soon. The Water Lily's crew held a funeral for the dead sailor. I was not specifically invited, but I felt a sense of responsibility, having witnessed the man's fatal plunge. Captain Wicker led the Christian service with customary grimness. I was surprised by the absence of... The sailor's companion, who had been arguing with him just before his fall. Yet, he was not the only one missing from the funeral. Oddly, only half the crew had come to pay the respects. I... Was in, went in search of the rest, only to find them making an offering in front of a makeshift Shinto shrine in the crew quarters. The fellow from the night before was amongst them. The captain doesn't want us at his Christian ceremonies. He thinks nothing of our faith, one of the sailors told me bitterly. We make our offerings here instead. Seems like half the crew is not very happy with the captain. Storm, too exhausted to write a proper entry. Suffice to say, we are still afloat. We settled down for the night. I am struck by an unrelated thought. Monsieur Fogg, the dateline! I have altered our watch already, Monsieur Fogg replied calmly. Did you think I forgot? Did you, th did you think I might forget? My master was, of course, correct. With an eye such as his, it was unthinkable he might miss such a detail. We reached the point directly opposite Greenwich, where the hours we had lost traveling around the Earth were added back. A whole extra day. That's a, that's a jab at the actual around the world 80 days in which fog doesn't remember the date line and they remember they have an extra day near the end of the journey as a sort of end of story like spike yesterday's storm hit us with little warning one moment i was uh preparing mr fog monsieur fox shaving water to the exact right temperature the next we were being tossed from one end of the cabin to the other we were only lucky the bed was securely nailed to the floor uh, rain clattered against our iron hull, nearly drowning out the shouts of the crew. The storm lasted nearly six hours and blew us off course. The captain spent most of the day peering at his charts, trying to locate our position. There was no land anywhere on the horizon. And now we divert to friggin' Honolulu. Gah! Who's taking a balloon? That's so cool! I want to take a balloon. 
He's taking a balloon. Oh, God. That guy made it. The captain announced a change in destination. The water lily would now make for nearby Hawaii rather than San Francisco. We would make port in Honolulu in five days and would find our own further conveyance from there. Monsieur Fogg's lips pressed ever so slightly together, a rare outward sign of, entirely understandable, annoyance. This, my master said, will not do. Indeed not, sir, I agreed, not even daring to calculate the delay and expense in our unexpected diversion would cause. Monsieur Fogg gave me a cool, appraising glance. Captain Wicker has reneged upon his word as a gentleman, he said curtly, before lowering his voice to an almost furtive undertone. Our course is clear. We must mutiny. I opened my mouth to agree wholeheartedly, but he continued on with so much as a pause. See to it, Passport 2. Use your... <laughs> um... Natural charm, I ejected brightly. Quite, he said, with the agreeableness of a gentleman who had just given his valet a near Herculean task. We will mutiny in five days when we reach Honolulu. Make your preparations as you see fit. All right, so I've been making good uh, friendships on board, but now I need to strengthen those friendships. My task was clear. I was to foment mutiny aboard the Water Lily. I decided to begin by exploiting the crew's animosity towards one another. Divide and conquer, or so dear mom and always counseled. I considered inflaming the religious passions, though such passions were by their nature unpredictable. So I decided to... Uh, ba -ba -ba -da, gossip about the captain planning to forcibly convert all the Shinto crew when we reached port. Some of the younger members seemed alarmed, but the others merely laughed off the possibility. Damn it. I should have sabotaged the shrine. It was, a satisfa it was with satisfaction I noted a certain increase in tension aboard the Water Lily, a situation I would carefully have to exacerbate if my master's mutiny was to be of any chance of success. Next, I attempted to ingratiate myself with uh, Commander Davis and the submar submariners, submariners, who were rather storm-tossed and disgruntled. There are no storms underwater, the commander muttered, her hair tangled beneath her cap. We should have submerged. I agreed. Captain Wicker risked all of our lives. I think perhaps he does not trust your ability as submariners. The commander's face darkened in my assertion. Perhaps you will write at that, she said. Perhaps so. I took my leave, giving my seed of doubt time to sprout in my absence. Alright, what's going on in the news? Police hunt card sharp known as the Reverend's Daughter, last seen in Yokohama. Ooh. I had attempted to suborn the obvious targets aboard the Water Lily, but wars were often won by the unexpected. With that in mind, I turned my attention upon... The valets and batmen to the ship's officers. Being a gentleman's gentleman myself, I knew the value of a good servant. Conversely, I was also aware of the disruption a bad one could cause. I appealed to them with my logic and reason, though unfortunately the most reasonable choice for them was to refuse my call to mutiny. They were not particularly happy with their positions, but I failed to offer them a practical alternative. My pleas fell on largely on deaf ears. Damn it, this might that might have ruined the mutiny right there. Perhaps I get one more chance before we arrive. I spent my day putting the last finishing touches of my planned mutiny. It was a matter of delicate and serious as the creation of a souffle by a master chef. I spread word of my signal amongst my allies and uh, stayed up late ensuring every man and woman was on my, on my side was true. Here it comes. Honolulu. We reached Honolulu in the dark. The captain took a small skiff onto the harbor with a few of his officers, wishing to inquire about repairs before putting the water lily in a dry dock. Monsieur Fogg watched the boat for a long moment. Now is the time, he said crisply. I trust everything is in order? Uh, I assured him it was. He nodded, having expected no other response. Let us hope so. With that, my master retreated to his cabin, and I called the signal to arms. The water lily erupted into chaos. Everywhere was the clash of sabers and pistols. Now and then I heard the shriek of the officer's sonic weapons. But I was not alone. Half the crew had followed the Shinto creed, fell in behind me with a rallying cry. They fought their Christian crewmates with vicious determination, clearing the top deck within the hour. The Chinese laborers, rewarding my friendship with steadfast loyalty, throwing themselves into mutiny with all the desperation of men and women who utterly loathed sea travel and longed to revenge 
avenge themselves upon the instruments of torment in any fashion. They lit fires and tore up the already ragged sails, causing some welcome chaos. There was a long, terrible moment when I wondered at their allegiance. Then Commander Davis caught my eye and winked. It's Izumi to my friends, she shouted cheerfully, driving back any stragglers loyal to Captain Wicker. I saw Mademoiselle Loretta trip up one of the loyal officers outside out of the corner of my eye. She tipped her bonnet in my direction, a gesture of respect from one player of the game to the other. The whirl of the battle took me away, but not before I saw her falsify a magnificent feint and block the gangway to the navigation room. By noon, it was clear how the day would end. The mutineers raised a ragged cheer of victory. I, myself, had ended up with a debonair scratch upon the cheek and had somehow come into possession of a brace of pistols and three sabers. By the time the captain and the officers returned, we had complete control of the ship. They were completely trussed up and thrown into the brig for safekeeping. Monsieur Fogg emerged, surveying the scene of recent battle with a calm eye. Well done, he said with a classic gentlemanly understatement. Still, it was done, and more, if I do say so myself. Wow! I pulled it off! So, we've taken control of the water lily and are heading straight on to San Francisco. To my amazement, the successful mutineers held a vote and elected me the new captain of the Water Lily. I was delighted. Can you imagine, my friends, your humble passport to captain of his very own ship? Rest assured, mes amis, it, I, it was in great part a ceremonial title, made no particular demands of my seamanship. Monsieur Fogg, though pleased by the success of our mutinous endeavor, seemed to regard my elevation and rank with some wariness. The new first mate, a cheerful girl by the name of Wang, came to me with an intriguing notion. As you know, the Water Lily is a ship-to-ship, ship-to-submarine prototype, she said. If the submariners cooperated, we could convert to submersible and make port at San Francisco in two days rather than five. I called in Izumi, who greeted me with a flourish and a bow. My dear captain, she declared, not bothering to hide her amusement. Did you have orders for me? Can you get us to San Francisco in four days? Izumi's eyes sparkled. Captain, I've been waiting for that order all my life. I'll make preparations and we will submerge tomorrow at dawn. The water lily is now completely different in shape. <laughs> it's adorable. Izumi was a woman of her word. At dawn, the water lily began its preparations to submerge. I cannot record the technical particulars of the enterprise, but my own experiences were thus. They began with unholy grinding of gears. So loud, I felt my head would shatter in two. The sails furled and the mast collapsed. The screw propeller engines transformed themselves. Bells and alarms sounded as the bulkheads were closed and sealed. Within an hour, the water lily had transmuted from a surface-skinning steamer into a watertight submarine. Izumi tossed me a fearless grin as she called for us to descend. My ears popped as we plunged ever deeper into the water of the Pacific Ocean, and a curious-sounding silence descended upon the vessel. Hauling ass. I was still captain of the Water Lily even in her new configuration. The crew saluted every time I happened to saunter in their vicinity. On the whole, I would rather recommend sub submarining to the discerned traveler. We surfaced a few miles out from San Francisco. Apparently a submarine emerging without warning in a harbor could cause all sorts of misunderstandings and complications. Izumi recommended that we row into port on a skiff. I formally renounced my captaincy to... Hmm... Izumi, as she was clearly the most capable sailor aboard the Water Lily. She blushed in pleasure and seemed unaccountably delighted. Good fortune, Passport 2, she called as we rode away. You will always have a home aboard the Water Lily. I turned towards San Francisco, still shrouded in a pale pre-dawn light. We have gained three days, my master said, and I could not help my answering smile. Whoop! We're in San Francisco! Yeah, boy! So, that was the story of the mutiny aboard the Water Lily. That's not even, like, the most involved part of my journey, though. I went across Russia using the Trans-Siberian Railway, and there were some cool plot points there, but I also know that if I went through India and Africa and uh, uh, Hong Kong, there are way bigger plots happening. And even better, if you want to follow the plot of the movie around the world in 80 days, plot point for plot point, the same plot stuff happens. It is in this universe, but you still hit those same plot beats and you still encounter similar or same characters. It is so cool. This is such a faithful fan game. Well, I guess it's a fan game and a continuation 
all in one. Now, if you want to see more 80 days, it would not take a lot to get me to do more 80 days. I especially want to try out the North Pole route because that sounds weird and I want to do it. I didn't even know it was in the game until after I finished my first playthrough. And trust me, even if I'm not recording it for you guys, I'm going to do more playthroughs. So thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, I loved um, the storytelling and the way that uh, that Gavin read the adventure he took us on. I like that idea of picking uh, a section of um, of the adventure in eighty days to to that's a bit more exciting to to share with everybody. And I liked how he kind of went from. Um, you know, from from the actual gameplay to editing in little bits and pieces afterwards um, so that he was telling the story and then adding in little bits and uh, pieces of gameplay and little tips and tricks to do along the way. Um, uh, my only thing is he read a little fast in places, but at the same time that kept the story going. Um, I kind of like the idea uh, that I've got from... from from this, which would be to take somebody full through a full story, but where it was done in, in little small chunks too. It almost was like a chapter book where you could, could get a new little chunk each week or each evening. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's fun. Those little small stories uh, within the within the bigger story. I liked how he was obviously, um, Gavin's obviously up to date on the Jules Verne book and so he sort of filled us in on little bits of um, making fun and jabs at the the original story in there as well and uh, I like the kind of fun little quirky sound effects he added in there as, as he went to so uh, and he made fast decisions on his story um, choices which was definitely my downfall when I played was uh, I was humming and hawing over those choices far too long so I think when I go in and play again and maybe try to like craft a um, a whole little uh, series of stories from it uh, I think what I would do is, uh, is is try to try to make those decisions quickly and just live with the decisions I I make which in some ways could be kind of um, uh, well, it's been a, would be a bit of a challenge for me, but also a lot of fun. So yeah, I enjoyed that. Thank you, Gavin. Okay, I'm uh, my voice is getting raspier, and so I am going to call it a night here. I'll see you guys on the other side. Bye for now.